As we go into this uh, message today, I'm going to direct your attention to Matthew chapter 2. In Matthew 2, we're going to read the story of the Magi in just a moment. I'll just tell you this funny little story. I think I woke up uh, Friday morning or Saturday morning. I couldn't remember which. And it was Saturday morning. I woke up Saturday morning. I told Judy, I said, I woke up and my first thought was, oh, thank you, Jesus. It's Monday. <laughs> and the wedding and the service and everything is behind me. Then I heard Judy beside me and I came back to reality and I'm saying, Dude, it's only Saturday. We haven't even started yet. I might be just a little bit extra tired today, but I am glad to be with you, and I want to share some good news with you. I want to ask the question, do you see what I see? I'm going to take that great song written in 1962 at the occasion of the Cuban Missile Crisis, November of that year, uh, the song was written as a, an appeal to God and sort of an appeal for peace. And uh, so it's an it's a interesting Christmas carol. I don't think we've gotten any other Christmas carols that way. But that particular one has um, struck me, and we're not going to go through every verse. This is the last verse that we're going to do in the song, Do You Hear What I Hear? Last week, I made the appeal uh, to you, are we hearing what God is saying? And and, and, and the, there's no mystery to it. All we have to do is look at what the prophets had said. Look at what the prophets had said, and you can hear the voice of God. But the, the extra point I tried to make is that as we, as we meditate on Scripture, as we read Scripture, as we pray Scripture, particularly the Psalms and the uh, Old Testament prophets and the Gospels, as we... As we declare those things we're actually building a treasure in our heart and the Holy Spirit can then breathe on that so instead of hearing all the stuff that the world wants us to hear right now we can hear the voice of God very clearly as the Holy Spirit highlights a verse that he wants us to know and I, I just I, I stick by that I really believe that there is something to be said there and I want to show you again something else and it's about vision. It's about the way we see things. Vision has a lot to do with the way we live our lives, the way we perceive our lives. So I'm just going to uh, remind you of the verse. Do you see what I see? A star, a star dancing in the night. That's just beautiful poetry there. I'm sorry, but that's just great. A star dancing in the night with a tail as big as a kite. Beautiful, perfect words. I'm going to just change it a little bit. So instead of T-A-I-L, like a tail to a kite, I'm going to turn it into T-A-L-E, as in the tail of the star. The star that uh, sat over Bethlehem. The star that led the wise men. Following a star, holding on to a promise, people of vision cannot be stopped by a difficult year. Following a star, holding on to a promise, people of vision cannot be stopped by a difficult year. Someone say amen. 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 Let me tell you why. And I don't like it any better than you do, so bear with me. I'm just, I'm just the donkey carrying the water, you know. On your worst day ever, is probably God's best chance at touching your heart. On your worst day ever is probably God's best chance to touch your heart. So um, when tough and difficult times come, there is an opportunity for God to touch us so deeply. So I just want you to hear that one more time. On your worst day is probably God's best chance of touching Amen? That being said, I want to take you to Matthew chapter 2, and I want to read for you um, about uh, 12 verses of the story and use it as a backdrop for um, what I want to share with you this morning. So if you would, I'm going to ask you to stand one more time with me. I think that um, I just... 
you know, I, I've heard people say, let's stand in honor to God's word. I, and I'm about that. I'm all about that. But I, I, I want us to hear something today that is more than something we've read a hundred times before. I want us to hear the voice of the Lord behind the words. So if you would, read and follow after me. Matthew 2, verse number 1. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all of Jerusalem with him. Gathering together all the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he lingered. He inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. And they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for this is what has been written by the prophet Micah, chapter 5, verse number 2, right? And you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah. For out of you shall come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. And then Herod secretly called the Magi and determined from them the exact time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem. And he said, go and search carefully for the child. And when you have found him, report to me so that I may come and worship him too. No, he was going to kill him. After hearing the king, he went, they went their way. And the star which they had seen in the east went on before them until it came and stood over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. After coming into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell on the ground, and they worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they presented to him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned by God in a dream not to come to Herod, the Magi left for their own country by another. Or in uh, another text, it said they went home a different way. You'll go home today a different way. If you look to that star and hear and see what God has for you, would you be seated? Father, I ask today in the mighty name of Jesus Christ that you would anoint your word and this vessel to accomplish all that you purpose to say and do so that our hearts might be encouraged, that we might be enriched, and that we might go home another way. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I don't need to ask you what have you seen this year. You know, the images are still burning in our minds. And we've seen cities burning, and we've seen needless deaths when we've seen uh, shutdowns and business closing and pandemic reports and numbers and all the things that have been thrown into the mix of this year, it's really easy to say, what have we been seeing? But it, it, it takes a little more faith to begin to see what God wants us to see. For if you ask Jeremiah or Amos or Zechariah, they could attest to you that the question that Jesus has asked of the prophet through the ages, probably more than any other question, is, what do you see? Because what you see determines how you will live, how you will respond, what you will do. Uh, Jesus, I say Jesus because uh, in the Old Testament we, we find out in the New Testament, the Old Testament prophets were guided by the voice of the Lord and it was Jesus who was guiding them and directing them. The question he asked most often was what do you see? And then, then it 
it, it appears again, you know, actually in the New Testament. And, you know, you remember the, the one particular blind man that Jesus anointed his eyes with clay. And he asked him, what do you see? And he said, I see men walking like trees. What does that mean? That means that he's starting to see something, but it's not clear. And, and so, so what does Jesus do? He prays again. And then he says, what do you see? And the response is beautiful. I mean, you know, a hug and love and worship. Jesus healed that man that day. So I'm going to just ask you if you would consider hearing this question today. Not what have we been seeing, but what, what do you see? Because what you see often will determine how wonderful God can be to you. If you can't see past all of the circumstances and the image and the media, social media and all the things that are in front of you, if you can't see past that, then God cannot be as wonderful to you as he wants to be. Because you get stuck with just the senses from the eyes, the ears, the nose, everything, our touch, you know, the five senses. We, get, we stop right there. And so I, I just want to... I just want to ruin your day and just tell you this everything you see right now in this room online anywhere everything you see everything you see according to the scriptures is temporal everything you see is temporal well when i see people of course they have an eternal soul I can't see your eternal soul. I see your outer man, your body, what you, what you wear, your earth suit, someone called it. You know, what you wear. I can see that and know behind that there's an eternal soul. But I just want you to take a moment and say, I'm, I'm not asking you to disregard everything you're saying, but I, I've seen throughout this year. But I, I do want us to just put it into perspective. Everything, literally everything you can see with your eyes is temporary. That's not like a winning statement, but it's, it's a truth. It's an eternal truth. So seeing what, when, when the Holy Spirit, when God speaks to us and he says, what do you see? He's asking you to see something beyond what you're seeing. He's wanting you to see something eternal, something that is deeper, so much so, so much deeper than what your eyes meet when our eyes connect. For example, and I'll use Abraham today as the best example I can think of, as someone who had to learn to see something that he could not see. We call Abraham the man of faith, uh, the father of faith, and I think rightly so. In Hebrews, certainly the writer of the Hebrews uh, regards him as such. I, I, I just want you to know that he was a man just like we are men and women. And um, he had to learn what we have to learn. So I'm going to take you to just one, one little uh, snippet of his life. In Genesis 15, in verses number 5 and 6, Abraham had a promise from God for a son, and he and his wife were aged and unable all of their married life to have children. And, but God does something in his 75th year, which was to give him a promise. It's found in, in Genesis 12. And in that promise, he said, I'm not only giving you a son, but I'm giving you a multitude. And out of your loins, out of your body, there will be a child that will bless the entire world. And that begins the nation and the story of Israel. In chapter 15, some decades later, God is still reiterating his promise. And everything that Abraham could see when he looked at himself, I mean, we would say, did you see my wife? Did you see her age? Did you see my body? Do you get how old we are? And now you're saying we are still going to have a child? And, and God has to take him outside. And here's verse number 5. Genesis 15, verse number 5. 
and he took him. I just love this picture. I just imagine God taking Abraham by hand and leading him outside. He took him outside and said, now look toward the heavens and count the stars. If you are able to count them, and he said to him, so shall your descendants be. Then he, Abraham, believed in the Lord, and he, God, reckoned it to him, Abraham, as righteousness. He takes Abraham outside. What dream have you lost during this pandemic or recently? What vision have you let go of? What does your heart grieve over that has been lost? And yet, you know that it was a gift from God to you. God gave it to you. Some are grieving the loss of their jobs. I, I just want to say for all the restaurateurs and restaurants, um, besides the fact that I love to eat and I love to visit you, you know, and by the way, the restaurants have provided probably the most sane gathering place that felt like 2018 or 2019 to me. So with Pennsylvania's shutdown of the restaurants for indoor dining, we have eliminated a lot of jobs. And, and I don't need to tell you that many of the waiters and waitresses who serve us at our tables, they're not white collar workers, they're not even blue collar workers. A lot of times they're people who, maybe they're working something part time, but this is, this is not a high paid position. It's, and it literally is not a career. Unless you own the restaurant or unless you are a, a, a manager, you, it's probably not a career. Sometimes it's just a stopping over place. But how many of you know that for some people, it's, it's their job? And I just want to say to the restaurants uh, and the workers there, I, 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 I grieve with you over the loss. And I pray that sanity would return and you, your jobs would return soon. Having lost something that was precious to us, having lost a dream or vision, I just want to ask you this little question, when was the last time you looked at the stars? Now, for me, you know, I'm a kid who grew up in five acres. We had five acres of land at our house. And behind that, my playground was 100 acres of woods. I lived outside a lot. I, I, I you know, spent a lot of time in my childhood outdoors in, in, in the beauty of nature. I learned a lot of things there and um, had a lot of great memories there. But you know how sometimes when life just gets really busy and we go from building to building, from room to room, and we're kind of sequestered, and then it gets colder out, you know, you, you, you do want to just kind of dash from your house to your car and from your car to the building, from your building back to the car and then back to the house and then back inside. You, you just want to avoid the outdoors a lot, you know. But I, if you've lost your vision, I, I'm just challenging you to – Look for a clear night and walk outside and look at the stars again. And you can know this for certain, that those stars that you stand under are the same ones that Abraham stood under. And the same God who spoke to him will speak to you. It's just life comes and goes and those stars remain. Life comes and goes and seed time and harvest and the cycle just continues and it's all supposed to reflect to us the faithfulness of God he opens his hand and feeds every living thing in the world outdoors he feeds everything and he has provided for us a way to feed ourselves but we still count on his goodness to send us rain to send us sunshine and God is faithful season after season, and they do vary. Some years, lots of snow, 
some years little snow, some years lots of rain, some years a little rain. But I want you to just be challenged that the next clear night that we have, which may not be tonight, stand outside and look at those stars and be reassured. In my life, my Abraham was my dad. My dad was my Abraham. He was the one who represented stability and faith and determination and um, an understanding that God would somehow provide and get us through. And Christmas after Christmas and year after year, my dad worked very hard to see that we had all that we needed. And I never missed a meal or worried about the mortgage or any of those things. He took care of it all. It was all done. Let me just use him as an example before we return to Abraham because I fear sometimes that when I mention Abraham that we put him on such a pedestal that we can't see him being a normal man. And sometimes there's a, this disconnect. When we look at the heroes in the Bible, the heroes of faith, sometimes they're just so larger than life that it's hard for us to relate to him, to them. So I'm going to ask you if maybe you can relate to my dad. So um, uh, maybe it's the Christmas season, but I'm especially missing him for some reason right now. But let me just tell you that he, uh, his name is on the sanctuary doors across the hall. The, the Richard S. Klein Sanctuary was named after my dad. He was a, a, a founding elder, original elder in the church. But he was a man of faith, a very simple man, and he didn't speak often. He was not at all outgoing. He was pretty much shy and uh, had a lot of common sense. But spiritually, there was a very strong vein, deep running through him. And uh, he was born again in a Pentecostal uh, church and setting. So my dad had been filled with the Holy Spirit. And, um, you know, he would be one of the first examples uh, that I would have ever had to see someone praying in the spirit and to experience that. So if I, I just want you to uh, appreciate with me the, that, that my dad was my Abraham. My dad gives me hope even though he's gone to be with Jesus. And I'm hoping that he will give you some hope today. So in a service like today, what could happen in any given service, usually was during worship, but oftentimes um, it could be when you least expected it. My dad, who never, ever volunteered to go up front to do anything, he never raised his hand and said, oh, uh, can we do this or whatever. My dad, uh, who always sat in the back and away from the crowds and whatever, um, with my mom, um, just did not want to draw attention to himself. He loved on kids, loved on people, but he was not very visible, okay? But sometimes in a service, much like this one, you could just hear a little stirring. By the way, I was praying in this building this week, and the Lord just brought this memory to my mind, and I no, I'm supposed to share it with you, but you could hear a little bit of stirring. And if you paid attention, you'd look over and you see it's my dad. He's just getting a little uncomfortable. Think of somebody who's thinking they have to get up in front of a crowd and say something, and they're so embarrassed to do it. He's starting to shift in his chair. He's starting to get a little bit uncomfortable. And then you start to hear something very quiet start to come up out of him. It might be sort of a moan. It might be sort of a groan, and then all of a sudden it turns into words, and then it gets louder, and then it gets louder, and then he's praying in tongues, and he's interceding. And let me tell you, when he would do that, the atmosphere would change. The whole building would suddenly be caught in the presence of the glory of God. <laughs> and after everything was said and done, we had all been changed, and we didn't know how. And my dad would be horribly embarrassed by what he had done to himself. 
and he'd be quiet and probably tried to slink out of the service at the end so that no one would confront him. My dad was my Abraham. The vein that runs deep, run deep in him, runs deep in me. And so that spiritual heritage goes all the way back, and it does to you too. No matter where you joined Jesus in this journey, if it was recently or after three or four generations, when you come into Christ, the vein goes all the way back to Abraham. He is our father of faith. Abraham was taken outside, and he said, to look up at the stars. And then God says to him, can you count those stars? Uh, you know, you just can't. Not with the naked eye. They have telescopes that can count and calculate and approximate and tell us how many billions of stars that we can see with our naked eye. But let the point is this, that God wanted Abraham to look up. He wanted him to see something that was from the heavens. He wanted him to, <coughs> not, to, to look away from his body, to look away from his age, to look away from his wife and his circumstances, and just look to God. Abraham, can you see those stars? And maybe today you're able to look and see the lights on stage. Just look at them for a moment and imagine that they are stars. <coughs> and know that God would say to Abraham, if you can count all those stars, I want you to know that your descendants will be like that. This is 25 years after the promise was given to Abraham. And something happened in that moment, and Abraham became convicted in his soul that God was faithful, and the promise was good, and the prospects looked bleak, but his faith grew strong. If we were to turn to the account in the book of Romans, in Romans chapter 4, and read the same thing, it says that under that starry sky, sky Paul, Paul the apostle says that Abraham believed God and he grew strong in faith. In other words, he was quickened by his faith. By looking at that, he began to look at the stars and not look at his body and his circumstance and his situation. And by looking at that, he began to believe in a God who calls into being the things that don't exist. He's the guy who shuts and no one opens. He's the guy who opens and no one shuts. He's that God. And Abraham believed God. Now, I'm going to just take you out on a ledge here and tell you that I believe with all my heart it wasn't seeing the multitude of stars that gave him the faith. I believe he saw one star. All he needed was one star. Brothers and sisters, I don't know if you know this, but like a multitude is insignificant if there's no children. He didn't have to have a multitude of children himself for God's promise to be true. All he needed was one star. All he needed was one child. All he needed was one promise. One promise. One child. And for Abraham, it ignited his faith. A vision might give us a big picture but seeing a promise where a word gives us faith, gives us hope. Abraham did not need to see a multitude of stars to believe. He only needed to see one star to believe. Abraham did not bear a multitude of children. For the word of God to be true, he only needed one child. His name was Isaac for the promise to come true. I believe that 
Abraham saw the big picture and that gave him vision. But I believe that he heard a word. He saw one star and therefore he began to believe God for one child. One child. Let me just take you fast forward into Jesus' days. In front of him is a multitude. There's 5,000 men. They didn't count women and children, so let's just go with 15,000. Let's just double the men, make it 10,000. Let's just double or or add to that one child each. You know they had more than that. But let's just say there's 15,000 people in front of him. And Jesus walks over to his elders, and he says to them, he says, hey, guys, um, I feel really bad because... These people have stayed and listened to the word of God long, and it's late, and they're hungry and tired and weak. Some of them didn't eat on their journey here. I'm concerned that if we send them home with nothing to eat, some of them will die on the journey home. So let's feed them. I wish Stephanie, Stephanie's watching online today. I wish Stephanie was sitting here because I would look at her and say, Stephanie, I've never done that to you. But anyways, um, could you just imagine Jesus turning to his disciples and saying, you give them something to eat. Yeah. So uh, they come back to Jesus and said, okay, here we got, we got, uh, we have uh, um, an inventory of food stuff right now. It's um, five little loaves and two small fish. And Jesus says, Good. Feed them. And you and I have to go like, what planet did you come from, Jesus? I have no idea what you're thinking right now. See, for Jesus, he didn't need to see um, a warehouse full of food before he fed them. All he needed to see was five loaves and two small fish. That was enough. I'm going to stretch you just a little further and just just to tell you that uh, some of the ministries that we're involved in require finances. Uh, I've asked you for an offering for Stephen Curry in Holy Land Missions. But uh, think of New Hope Ministries. Think of Mettered House. Think of uh, Sun Power Ministries. Think of these ministries and, and, and just imagine with me that they have financial needs. And I'm just going to pick one. Let's just take our friend Pete Einstein. And let's just say that Pete Einstein came to me and the rest of the board. And he said, I have an opportunity and uh, all the doors are open. We just need one thing. And um, we say, okay, what is that one thing? All we need is a million dollars. I'm going to just tell you that a million dollars is still a lot of money. A million dollars is still a lot of money to me. And I don't need to see a bank full of money. I don't need to see dollar bills coming into the coffers. I don't need to see people of wealth and resources coming to gather around. When God has given me a word and we need to believe him for a million dollars, I don't need a million dollars right now. I just need the first word. Dollar. I just need that first dollar to believe God that the rest of them are coming. Now, I know that that doesn't fit budgets and it doesn't fit arithmetic and it makes boards crazy. I know that. I get that. And by the way, don't worry, there's nothing facing us like that right now, but I'm just using it as an example. Jesus <coughs> saw a multitude. He wanted to bless them, but he didn't need to see grain fields standing and harvesters waiting. He just needed five small loaves, two small fish put it in front of him. I'm going to suggest to you that that's exactly what happened to Abraham. Abraham didn't need a multitude of stars to believe God would bring a multitude of sons from his loins. He only needed to believe that God would bring him one son. And that one son would be the beginning of a multitude. I hope that I've made sense there because really I'm asking you today, what do you see? You've lost your hope. You've lost your vision. You've lost your dream or whatever. But I'm asking this, what do you see? 
Do you see a problem? Do you see an opportunity? Or better yet, do you see past the problem to Jesus? Lifting our eyes unto Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of our faith. Stop looking at what everybody else is looking at today if you want to see what God wants you to see. If you look at the same thing that everybody else is looking at, you're going to have the same fear. You're going to have the same lack of courage. You're going to have the same response that everybody else is having. You have to look past the the problem. You have to look past the giant. You have to look past the multitude. You have to look past all that and see Jesus. So the wise men started out in the east and followed a star. Wise men do not follow a multitude of stars. They follow one star. And there is one star that God has raised up that is above every other star. If you follow that star, it will always lead you to Jesus. He is the one star that we need. He is that one loaf that we need. He is that one dollar that we need. He is that one child. He is that one word that we need. Let me tell you, if you need a word from God today to have faith, to believe him for tomorrow, I'm going to tell you the word. His name is Jesus. He's giving you a word. He has already given you a word. His name is Jesus. And that word became flesh, and he became the fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham that blessed all the nations of the world. He is the desire of all nations. So wise men do not look at a multitude of options. They do not look at a multitude of stars. They look at one star and they follow that star. And if it contradicts the powers that be, they follow that star in spite of the consequences. If you have a multitude of problems right now, you only need one answer. His name is Jesus. If you have a mountain of unbelief right now, you only need one word. His name is Jesus. If you have a multitude of storms in your life right now, you only need one safe harbor. His name is Jesus. If you have a crushing load of guilt and shame, you only need one Savior. His name is Jesus. And it's that star that you and I need to follow. Do you see what I see? Abraham saw more than a multitude of stars. He saw more than a multitude of afflictions. He saw more than a multitude of problems. He saw more than a multitude of reasons why his mind told him that he could not have a child in his advanced age. He saw one star, and that one star on that starry night had a name, and that one star became his son. Isaac, and Isaac became Jacob, and Jacob became 12 tribes. Oh, and it just multiplied. You know, there were 450 who went down into Egypt, and there were a multitude of between 2 and 6 billion people who come out of Egypt. That's another story for another day. Nearly three millennia later, some wise men still follow the same star that Abraham saw, and it always leads us to Jesus. Do you see what I see? I do not see 2020, the year from hell. I see Jesus, who's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Years come and years go. Hard times come, hard times go, but he remains the same. I see Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of my faith, so I won't fear. Because your worst day is God's best chance to touch your heart. Will you see what I see?